Hello, my name is Wes. Welcome to Morning Moments. We are a group of God-fearing believers who come together through Skype and do a Bible study on a weekly basis and dig into the Bible chapter by chapter. We base our fellowship out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, which speaks of submitting one to another in the fear of God, having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather exposing them. So we believe in exposing false teachings and holding to the teachings of Christ, which speaks of heart purity. We're glad that you were able to join us today, and we hope you are blessed by our fellowship. God bless. So I'm thankful to be uh, for everyone that's here today, and um, we're going to start in the book of Ephesians, go back to Ephesians. I think that we didn't quite finish up. Um, and I'd like to, uh, Daniel, are you there, my brother? Yeah, I'm here. No problem. Hi. Okay. You kind of quiet this morning, you know? <laughs> so, oh, I was, I, I was frantically posting away on a Facebook post. Sorry. While I was listening to you. Oh, Sorry. My, my okay. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, praise the Lord. Let's, let's, I think we left off at verse 19 last week, uh, Daniel, uh, yes. so if I'm correct, um, if not, let me know. Uh, so let's start at verse 20. And go okay. to the end. I know we read it once before the other day, but just to refresh, let's go through and read that. Would you do, do the reading for us this morning? Yeah, sure. So you want me to start at verse 19 or 20? Which one? Yeah, let's start at verse 20, if you don't mind. Okay, no worries. <clears throat> right, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so the wives to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to it himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife that she reverence her husband. Amen. Is uh, someone recording this? Do we have someone on record now? Yes, Cedric. Okay, good. All right. Uh, very good. Thank you, Daniel, for reading that. Um, I noticed in verse 20, it says to give thanks and always for all things unto God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have a lot of things that happen to in, in, us in our lives and some things are bad, seemingly bad, some things seemingly not so seemingly good. Uh, but we know in Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So whether it's seemingly at that time that that thing seems bad that's coming into your life, if we give it to the Lord and we trust in God, walking in his love and loving him, that it's going to work out for our good. And loving him, as we know, means if we love him, we keep his commandments. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, also it reiterates what's said there. In, in verse 18 of chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So everything that we uh, have in our lives, we give thanks for to the Lord because we know that the Lord is in control. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will lead and direct your path. So knowing that, we know that God is, is directing us. We know that God's going to take care of us. We trusting in him. We bring our requests to him. Like it says in Philippians 4, uh, rejoice always. You know, again, we say rejoice. Uh, he says, uh, let your requests be made known unto God with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. 
It gives you the peace that passes all understanding and keeps your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So we want to make sure everything, every day, we give in thanks for that because the Lord is doing something in us and for us through whatever we go through. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Next scripture says, uh, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Um, when he's talking about submitting ourselves to each other, anybody have a comment on that? What, what, that, act, what that really means? Well, I think not, not uh, people not esteeming themselves one above the other. I mean, there may be some in the ministry, you know, as we just covered in chapter four, you know, where he's given, in this case, um, some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, you know, per per perfecting of the saints. So even though someone may have a seemingly a more responsibility in the in the in the church, um, that doesn't mean we're uh, necessarily to be viewed above another. We're all, we're all trying to build and edify the church as a whole. It seems like, Daniel, that the Lord is in, in, in these last verses in this chapter, he's talking about a relationship between a man and a woman, comparing it to the relationship of Christ and his church, of that yeah. submission, of that r relationship uh, it, you know, is what, we're, what we uh, I, I see in this, you know, as the wife, uh, as the next verse we get into where the wife submits herself to her husband, just like to the Lord. Uh, th those are very strong words, you know, and um, a lot of women have a lot of problems with that. Uh, matter of fact, it goes down to verse 24. It says, therefore, as, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Does that word everything actually mean everything? I want to ask you guys uh, to answer that. Uh, give me an answer if you would. Does, does everything mean everything? Well, in the context of spiritual um, growth and um, sharing the word and building up the faith, I mean, you, 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 you um, I mean, th th there's not be, I mean, some people can read that and think it and go overboard of it, but don't forget that it, we, we're, a husband is to act um, to his wife in the same way Christ acted to the church and he gave his life for the church. So we also have to view our wives as giving our lives to our wives, you know, and cherish and love of the wife as Christ loved the church. That's, that's, that's a deep bond. Okay, a lot of people, Daniel, will, will think that, well, you know, uh, my wife needs to submit to me and everything, everything that I tell her. You know, there was a case where Ananias and Sapphira in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5 where they, uh, where they both lied uh, to Peter uh, about what they sold their property for, and a woman was privy to it. Her, her husband, it doesn't say, but her husband could have told her, listen, you tell them that we sold the property for this and we're going to keep this money back. In that case, she should not have submitted to her husband, right? No, she should have corrected him. She probably said, "This isn't. This doesn't seem correct in the spirit to be uh, withholding something from the Lord. We're going to we're going to essentially be lying to the spirit. You know, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to essentially in your heart to say something is uh, true when, it, when you know it's not to be true by your conscience." Okay. So, so when you're taking everything, you, you're taking the, the, the context of the scriptures, what it's talking about when he says everything. A lot of times I've also found in scripture where it will, it will say always, like uh, Paul would say, I, I, I pray for you always without ceasing. Or in Philippians 3 where it says that uh, you have always obeyed. Uh, and not necessarily meaning that it's without taking a breath. It's like when, when you're going to sleep, I'm, I'm praying for you when I'm sleeping. I'm praying for you. It, it, I, I think sometimes it gives the connotation well, that, it, yeah. that it's, it's something that's going on a lot. You know, a well, lot. I think all, yeah. well, yeah, of course, but, but always used a lot. I mean, when I, you know, as you know, when I was in universalism, we used to use verses all over the place from like, first Timothy where, you know, God is the savior of all mankind. Right there you go. It's all, all means all mankind, you know, but exactly. forget, 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 completely forgetting the context of these talking to a believers that are walking holy and blameless that are continuing to walk by the spirit. So it, it, if you just cherry pick out all the time, I mean, if you come to the text like this and just trying to think that, oh, yes, I'm man is head of the woman and that means I can just tell her what to do, then you're completely missing the point. I mean, you're still in the flesh. Mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 that bad. I mean, especially when you read the scriptures about Christ giving his life to the church, we, we have to have the same sort of um, view of our wife and cherish our wife and love her, love her in that sacrificial way. 
to ensure then, because we're in a way responsible, if we're feeding her the word and giving her edification, we're responsible for her soul in a way as well, because we're, we're ensuring, we must ensure that we tell her the truth and, and uh, from, um, from the word. Okay, another question. Uh, I'm going to ask you this, Wes. Um, in, in the scripture, it says that in, in Galatians 3, and uh, in 28, it says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. Uh, and it goes on, and uh, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So a lot of people will say, well, you know what, I, I don't, I don't, uh, th when it starts talking about women this and men this, we, we don't apply that anymore because there's no, there's no difference between men and women. In other words, when uh, even for the requirements for, a pa uh, for an elder that we talk about in 1 Corinthians 3, I mean, First Timothy chapter three, uh, all those things that talks about and then women submitting to husbands uh, and everything, all these things that well, there's no difference between a man and a woman there. So we, we I hear people say that and they void out these scriptures by using Galatians chapter three. Can you explain that uh, somewhat to me, uh, Wes? Yeah, there is. There's no difference between a man or or a male or a female or a Jew or a Gentile in the sense of everybody's opened up to the covenant to become saved. But there obviously is a difference in roles that we play um, because like the, the scripture says, let not all seek to be teachers for we will receive stricter judgment. And I use that passage to show that um, not all are teachers because he tells you for not everybody to to seek after to, that type of office or that position um, because we're, we're going to have a, a stricter judgment. And, it, you know, who, he who desires to be a bishop desires a good thing or desires spiritual gifts, yet I will show you a more excellent way. So there's all people could desire to to do different things and be productive for the kingdom of God. But it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that everybody has the same position. But yet we're still all equal in the eyes of God because we're the body of Christ and we all play our role. And like Jesus talked about with the talents, one was given five talents, one was given one talent, one was given, what is it, three talents. So and each one was given according to their ability. So not everybody has the same ability, according to what Jesus, you know, speaks in that parable. And God only requires whatever gifting or talent that he gave you to produce with that talent. And men and women have different roles in the Bible, but it doesn't make the man greater than the woman. And Paul kind of says that he says that man came from woman. There's no way that man would arrive or come out, come into the earth without women. So men need women and women need men in different aspects. Uh, David, I want to ask you a question, David Kohler. Um, say, say in this situation, okay, you got, you've got where these women, uh, women, wives are to submit to their husbands. Uh, of course, in First Corinthians 11, we see the husband uh, is submitted to the Lord. You know, he's under, under the Lord. The wife is under the husband. Uh, under, uh, uh, covering is the man, the, the, uh, and then the Lord is, you know, we're under the Lord. We're submitted to the Lord. So uh, say, say uh, I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to submit to my husband because I, he doesn't show me any love. <laughs> or, I'm, or the husband saying, I'm not, I'm not going to really love my wife and show love to my wife because she doesn't submit to me. <laughs> what, yes. what, how should we, how do you deal with something like that, David? I find no conditional clauses in the commands. There's no conditional clause. If he does this submit, it's always submit. It's obey. It's trust. There's no Good. conditional clause where there is an exclusion or a caveat where that is not mandatory. It's okay. Yeah. So what you're saying is, is even though your, your husband is, is uh, not showing you love, you, you still want to honor the word, the word of the Lord and still submit to him. Is that correct? Well, ab absolutely. And where I was ultimately going with that, because there's no condition, because there's no condition, you're still dealing with two human beings and two people married, no way out. 
and toe to toe every day, there has to be a leader. There has to be a follower. Okay. It has to be. You can't yeah. both lead. You both can't follow. And the hierarchy but, that's very clear in the scripture was that. But the point I'm getting at is we are supposed to do our own job regardless of how the world or the, our spouse does their job. And I think that's quite clear from Christ's life. He lived the way his father wanted regardless of how mankind would receive it to the point of the cross. I think we missed the, a huge opportunity to show what Christ was trying to show in that leadership and that headship. I know my wife, no matter what she could do, she can never do enough against me that I have done against my God. So I could never not forgive her if I fully expected to be forgiven by Christ. Mm -hmm. I can't. That's how I look at it, brother. Good, good, very good. Appreciate that. Anybody else Amen. have a comment on that? Yeah. I mean, the, te the temptation can come strong for, for the man not to show his wife love if, if she's not submitting to him and just going off to do what she wants to do and, and not listening to anything that, that he has to say. And the same token, a, w a woman cannot say, I'm not. I've had women come to me and have counsel. And I said, there is no way I'm submitting to that man the way he treats me. There is no way. And, and, and this has happened. Uh, this happens all the time. Somebody else have a comment? I, gu I guess. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh. um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you go. Sorry. And real quick, I just want to throw in a First Peter three one about the wives being mm -hmm. subject to their husbands, so that you, some even so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without the word or conduct of their wives. It's just living living a life like like Christ would have lived, and honoring your husband, even if he may not even be worthy <laughs> of it. You're just like David was saying; you're doing it because it's a command from God. It's not conditional, you know. Sorry, go ahead there, Daniel. No, no. I mean, you brought up a good point. I mean, I, I mean, I think you know the context of uh, of of this chapter of this verse in this chapter. It's talking, you know, you could say to believers, but of course, you know, we encounter in our in our day to day, we've got people that are mixed together that are non-believers with a believer, you know, and mm. and you know, there could be a case where, yeah, a man, a husband who's a non-believer could be being abusive to his wife, you know, and beating mm. her up and stuff like that. So, you know, there, there, yeah, there has to be a little bit of um common sense you know in submitting in that way yeah submit to the point where you know um preservation of life or whatever but um you know you have to pray earnestly about it uh, and there there are some difficulties when then when insistence on this occurs when when there's a mix of non-believers together I, I mean i do get the point in uh first peter three subject to your own doesn't you may you may win him by the word but i i you know that it, it, you're right there's no conditions there but i presume the conditions are generally not when uh, one of the other spouse is really abusive and uh being pretty pretty evil to the other person yeah that's a good point daniel um, you know you know the world the world basically says that um you know you everybody's to be equal that you know that they just i hear so many people say uh, especially from the woman's side saying there is no way I'm going to submit to any man, you know, and that is the attitude of a lot of the world, uh, especially the, 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 what we call what the world calls the left side, you know, uh, they, they just, uh, you know, certainly, uh, uh, reject that kind of thinking altogether. I think because they think that by, by a woman submitting to a man, it puts the woman in a position of a floor, of a, like a doormat, or that she's less than that man, uh, and look, being looked down. And the scripture's clear, and, and like you said in First Peter three, it says that the way, uh, to honor the women, uh, show honor to the to your wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs according to the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, a, a husband's prayers could be hindered if she's if he's not loving her and treating her as an equal. But uh, the world looks at it, and many look, women look at it as, as though they look down. But this is not God doing that, going, doing that in that manner. That's God's order, and we just follow God's order of the way he had it. And when we follow that way, we know that we're truly blessed. 
Yeah, I mean, the, fo- the the wisdom of the world is foolishness to us. For those in Christ Jesus, this this is just, I, I don't think even a bit of an issue, really, because if wives and husbands are both submitted to Christ, they, they understand this relationship that they're meant to have because it's, you know, it's, that's how it's been ordered. But of course, compared to the world wisdom, it, it seems completely daft and uh, they just want to run things contrary to God's word. Um, can, I, can I say something? Sure. Um, for me, I feel like the reason why um, some people... Oh, this is Princess, by the way. Hi. Hi, um, for, for me, I feel like the reason why uh, some women are kind of afraid of submission is because I think they misinterpret the idea of submission as to oppression, like being oppressed and like not having a voice or something. And I think it's because women don't understand their roles and they're trying to fit into that society perspective of I can do anything a man can do. I feel like it's that feminist uh, kind of mentality that they have. But that's why it's important to be in a relationship where the man is obedient to Jesus because you know if he's being led by God, you'll feel comfortable in following his mission because his mission for the relationship, for the family, will be God's mission for the relationship. So in henceforth, as you're submitted to your husband, you're low-key, like, submitting to God, if that makes sense. But just like what someone was saying, I don't know the name, but, like, I feel like every marriage is different. Like, um, if the relationship is not, like, equally yoked, maybe, like, they were both, like, not Christians at first, and then one of them decided to share the gospel. I mean, Peter talks about it, how, like, we still, like, through our lifestyle, I don't know the exact word, but I'm paraphrasing, but through us, like, living righteously, it can influence the marriage. But, like, if one of them decides to be like, hey, the marriage is not going to work, you know, we can leave the marriage if, if it's in that um, context. But I feel like at the end of the day, if you've been in an abusive relationship or like something is not going wisely, I feel like you have to be wise. And like, I'm not saying I don't know how that relates onto divorce because God says he hates divorce. And the only boundaries for divorce he gave us was like unfaithfulness. But I feel like during that abusive stage, you know, um, God is God is great. I feel like you can separate yourself from that and pray. And just ask God for protection, and God is strong enough to influence and change the man's heart, I feel. So I just feel like in every context, it's different. But at the end of the day, um, I think we are still supposed to submit to God's order and let God do the rest, if that makes sense. Because if you're honoring God, I feel like God will honor the relationship and he can um, change the context, if that makes sense. That's my perspective on it. Yeah. Thank you, Prince. I think oh, very good. I think yeah. submission to to God, it's like we're all submitted to somebody. So, um, like what we just read, you know, submitting one to another in the fear of God. So even the the male, the they're submitted to God, or they're we're submitted to one another. And like Romans chapter thirteen says, submit to be subject to the governing authorities. So then we're subject to the governing authority. So in Jesus, you know, shows how every believer is supposed to live in feeding their enemy, praying for their enemy. You know, if your enemy asks you to go one mile, go two. All that's a form of submission that whether you're male or you're female, um, we're, we're still portraying this image of submission that we might even win the unbeliever or somebody out in the world over by our good conduct, just like how Mark brought up about the woman winning over their husband without a word. That that imagery is really, you know, could be used in both male or female. And you see this in the book of Daniel. If anybody reads the book of Daniel, you're going to see that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, have this image of they're submissive to Nebuchadnezzar or to someone that is evil but yet they still won't bow down when it goes against their conscience or where it goes against their God. They portray an image of perfect submission. And out of it, you know, it gives Daniel authority. Out of it, it gives, you know, them a position. So people might be looking at submission wrongly because submission actually, if, if it's done rightly, it brings about authority it doesn't bring about weakness and doesn't make you like a, 
um, a, a mat, you know, that people wipe their feet on. It actually gives you a position of authority to speak from. You, you know, too, Wes, uh, it, when you think about the relationship between you and you and the Lord and your relationship between you and your wife, uh, we submit ourselves uh, to the Lord because we know that the Lord loves us. You know, we love him because he loved us. He laid down his life for us. We know that through the scriptures, the Lord's looking out for our, our best interests. Romans 8 says, if God be for us, who could be against us? So we submit to the Lord because it, because his word says so, because we've honored the Lord, because we know the Lord loves us. I, I think that as men, as, as husbands with our own wives, when our wife steadfastly knows that we love them, it makes it a lot easier for them to submit to us. Um, it's when the woman begins to doubt that. Now, even though the Lord himself does not give us everything that we ask for, we know that he loves us. So the woman may want something and you know it's not the best thing for the family or whatever, and you may have to say no, and some women will take that like, you know, you're, you're, you don't love them, and that's not so at all. But I, I, I just wanted to state that, you know, it talks about us loving our wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for us and like us loving our own bodies and we cherish and nourish our bodies that we to cherish and nourish our wives. And we do compare our love for our wives compared to the love of the Lord for us and laying down our lives for our wives. And I uh, just wanted to get um, some comment on, on those particular um, issue things I just brought forth. Anybody have anything? Agree or disagree? Well, I would ask you to consider this. Submit yourselves one to another. It's not natural. We all we all bristle at that. The reason I said those commands are not conditional. Think about it this way: in a world that is corrupted by sin and everything else that goes on around us, if someone's not the first one to do their part, regardless of whether or not they're receiving their due, who will ever do it? In other words, if a woman's waiting for a man to leave, to leave, to live a godly life so she'll submit, well, when would a man want to forgive his wife until she submits to him? So if it goes both ways, therefore it's a breakdown. Someone has to submit. If, if a man submits to God, that means no matter what his wife does, he's going to forgive her, take care of her, separate her from the pack, love her till he dies, whether she submits or not. Period. Done. No way out till death separates. Oh, but on the other hand, then if it's supposed to work like that, then where's the woman's excuse waiting for him to love that way when he's commanded to love that way, whether or not she submits. So the system only works if we submit one to another. I, I know that sounds like simple talk, but it is like that. It doesn't work unless someone submits. Wes, you brought up Paul said to pray for those who are in charge of us, you know, like Nero, the one who's going to cut Paul's head off and crucify him upside down. You know, the graft, greed, and corruption of the Roman Empire? Submit to them, he said. I don't see a way around it. Amen. And, and that's, that's a great point that you're bringing up, David. Because even Jesus, you said, it. yeah, this is very simple. But Jesus gave this same idea in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, says, But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive something back, what credit is that to you? Is, and it says, for even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. 
but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward is great in heaven. So yeah, we can, you can't wait, like you're saying, David, until somebody else does you good or you, you know what's coming, what you think is you're deserving of is coming back to you. And then I'm going to display this imagery of submission. And you know, as long as all T's are crossed and all I's are dotted, and then once everything's going right, then you're going to I'll give back. But it doesn't work that way. You know, you we have to be the light that shines in a dark world. And I think that that's what you're saying, David. Yes. Yes. Amen. That That's exactly what I was saying. Amen, brother. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I've been listening to everybody while I, um, I heard this scripture in Colossians uh, 3, uh, which is what we're all talking about here, about submitting one to another, and wives submitting to their husbands and the husbands to their wives, uh, to love their wives and do not be bitter towards them. But I went on a little further, and I heard the word, do not provoke your children. And I recently had an about with my youngest daughter, 19, and uh, over something I saw her doing online, uh, which I didn't approve of. And I openly scolded her about it. And she came back in a, a messenger and said, I am tired of being criticized. And then she blocked me. And that was the end of uh, talking to her again. And then I heard some other things about talking to other people about me. But... Um, I really felt sorry uh, in my heart and I repented. I'm writing a letter to her right now because uh, uh, the Living Bible says, fathers, don't scold your children so much that they become discouraged and quit trying. And that's exactly what I did. And, you know, and you can take that into any part of your life, how you talk to other people, your wife, your husband. You know, it's not what it's not what he just got done saying in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, which Boyd was talking to me about in a post, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. You know, and it goes on, but how Christ forgave us, so we all must do to others and, be the, and put on the bond of love. You know, that's... A bond of perfection and i was just going over this real quick while i was listening to y'all and i'm going lord help me and i just my heart is just breaking right now so you know and this is good it's always a good thing to have your heart breaking a contrite so, a heart contrite heart is you know precious in the sight of the lord so and i'm not saying that just blah 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 but i'm really feeling it and it's like the, Ho the holy spirit is convicting me right now so I just wanted to share that. Praise God. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, what is it? It's humility. It's if God says something, you humble yourself before him and don't try and be God yourself. Don't try and be proud and make up your own conditions. To him, but humble yourself before God and submit to him. And, and I was looking at 1 Corinthians 11 there. And it's kind of interesting. I don't understand the whole thing there. Um, but when it says that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So I'm sure that that plays into all this as well. And I, I thought it was interesting how it says the head of every man is Christ. So it's it's whether they're submitting to him or not, because probably 99.99 whatever percent of men will never submit to Christ. And even in the judgment, they'll be cursing him and shaking their fist at him. But he is their head. And the head of every wife is her husband. So, I mean, that, that goes into it as well. What is going to be the end of those who do not submit to Christ, of those men who do not submit to him as their head? It's just, you know, it's all there, kind of like David was saying. I mean, with these things that pertain to us and the body it pertain to our relationship to us and Christ as well. It's just something to think about.
So the main thing uh, that we learning from this is you need to do your part, whether you're the husband or the wife, uh, do, do your part. And when the when there is a disagreement uh, between a husband and wife uh, and, they're, and you're in the heat of the moment, um, you know, this is the time to really do what it's saying here. You know, um, I found uh, uh, some husbands will try to make their wives submit. And you, you can't do that either. Uh, he's not telling, saying here, man, uh, for the man, to hu hey, husbands, make your wife submit. He's talking to the wife. Then he's talking to the husband. If she doesn't do her part, that's between her and God. If he doesn't do his part, that's between him and God. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I've had times in my life where wife uh, did not submit to me, did not want to, and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm just giving you what I feel the Lord has me to say and do." But if you don't want to do it, that's between you and you and God. I'm done. That's I, it's out of my hands then. Anybody have a comment on that? You know, I've actually found that I'll just use myself and my wife. And in my battle with her and her not submitting exposed my own heart in how I was not submitting to God. And I've, I quickly found that every time I found something she did to me, the Lord would show me how I did that to him. So I found in my relationship, if there was a lack of submission in our relationship, I wasn't going to blame my wife anymore. I blamed me that I wasn't doing my part. I'm being serious. And that's why I say, if someone doesn't do their part first, who's going to do it? Man, well, that's what that's why think about all, it. Yeah. And that's why we've all come to the place that we're at, hopefully, where we have repented. Repented means to change the mind that you're not doing it that way, or else we're if we're if that is the case, then we're just hypocrites by by telling our wife or or or, or instructing our wife in a certain way and that comes back at us and we have to realize that we're still blind we're still hypocrites and we're still lost because we're not we're, we're not submitted to god right david that's how i took it in my life yeah. and it, our lives didn't change until i said you know what i'm taking responsibility this is my fault i am i'm being serious and yeah, I, I confronted her and i said do you think you've got any skin in the game here? Do you think you're uh, any fault? She said, no. I said, okay. I guess yeah. it is my fault. And that, obviously, her statement was not correct because you can't live with someone and be in a relationship and not be wrong. You can't. You're a human. Somehow, somewhere, you can't always be right. So it, it breaks down all the barriers. And I've all, you'll always hear me say this. The battle's not out there. The battle's in my heart. Not, not Jenny's heart, not my neighbor's heart, not my son's heart, my daughter, my heart. And when I realized the battle was mine, my life changed completely in perspective. Because someone has to start it. And we live in a world of, of, of personal privilege beyond recognition. I mean, we're entitled to everything. Everything. And maybe, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother. No, no. I, I just wanted. I just wanted to clarify something. Maybe I misunderstood it. You, you are saying that you made a statement that said you you cannot live in a relationship with a wife or husband and always be right. Um, can you expound on that? I don't. I don't quite understand that. According to the word, can you give me scripture or anything to help me with that? Just everyday experience. Uh, you, know, you, you get in a conversation, and it's a perspective thing. And my, my perspective is one way, hers is another, and it's no major crisis. But then it leads to an argument. And later on, you find out, like, oh, I really got the wrong calendar date. It was, I was wrong. And I've gotten an argument over, like, no, it's, I, I don't need to be there. That's not this week. It's next. Well, you know how those things go. 
just as something that minor. And it starts, it starts minor, but it can build into huge fights within a relationship. And remember, the battle's not out there. The battle's our own heart and how we deal with it and how we take in what happens to us. Well, I, I, I seem to, um, and, and maybe somebody, if you want to correct me on it, but I seem to, by, by the word of God, I look at Christ and I think that he was always right. And even in a relationship, he was always right. Uh, and I think in the same way as following his steps that uh, the man uh, or the woman could be always right. It doesn't, the scripture doesn't tell us that, that they couldn't be. Uh, just because even if, even in our own lives, if if we by experience find the opposite, that doesn't uh, nullify the scripture that uh, says that uh, like First Peter chapter four, and you know the scripture as well as anybody does that that um, those who are suffering the flesh has ceased from sin. Sin is 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 what's not a faith is sin. What's um, uh, you know of course you, we all know that, but I, I just have trouble with the, with the point of saying that. You can't always be right. I, I don't find that in the scriptures, and maybe you could help me with that if that's so. Well, I think I think that what he's saying is you you can't always be right in the sense that we're not perfect in knowledge, so we're not without mistake in the sense of if you have a calendar day and you think it's a one way, as long as you're humble to be like I could be wrong because my memory could actually fail me. And Jesus, you know, grew in knowledge and understanding. So what would Jesus do? Jesus could be like, you know, in his humanity state, he, since he's not all knowing as Father God is in his humanity state, he could be wrong, have wrong information in some aspects. So Christ would be humble enough to admit that he doesn't know all things. And that's what we would do. And if we have that attitude of humility, since we're not perfect in knowledge, yes, you would be a hundred percent right if you had the heart of humility of having uh, being open to the fact that you could be wrong in information. Yeah, thank you for that, Wes. That was good. I, that's, that clears it up really nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Like what what Wes said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. But let's take it a step further. Suppose Jenny decides that she isn't going to submit, and I am doing it right. And we get in an argument. I'm like, I am right. And she goes, yeah, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. I go, well, that's clearly wrong. Yeah. All right. Forgive me. Why, why, I need to forgive her. How many times? As she learns what submission is and isn't. So it's not so clear cut. If we think it's that clear cut, we better reevaluate where we're at. It, this is, you know, the adversary is still alive and well. And if we're living right, then that means he's working overtime. Think about it. If he, he's not busy with the rest of the world, they're already his. He doesn't have to trick them. They bought it, hook, line, and sinker. 99.99%. He's got a lot of horsepower to commit to uh, in these perilous times. We must be very cautious and careful. Then Christ warned us about being deceived. I, I don't necessarily think he was just talking about doctrine. I was thinking he meant like everything. Yeah. That's all. Amen. Yeah, I think like, you can, if I may, ahead, I think you can also be right and still be wrong. And, and an example might be like, Kind of like Amen. what Dave was saying. Yeah, I'm right, and and I know my wife is wrong. I know this is the right date, but then if you get into an argument and you have to dominate, and your position has to be right, and you have to show her just how correct you are, and maybe even take it further and humiliate her because you're always right, and you are right. Maybe you're wrong in all of your rightness because your attitude was wrong. You know, so you could be right. Yeah, you're right. And yeah, I'm going to show her I'm right. And see, see right here, I'm right. See, and you were wrong. And now you're wrong. You Amen, know. brother. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's kind of mm -hmm. like what happened with Job. Because Job was right. He was living right. I mean, according to Job chapter one, 
you know, God says, can, have you considered my servant Job? And, and speaking to the devil, who is the accuser that was, you know, coming before God. But you, but you see that Job was supposed to be patient. Job, would, even through all that Job went through, if he were to have not tried to defend himself, but rather give place to the wrath of God, then, then Job would never had to have come to a place of repenting of anything. Um, not to say that Job was in sin. He was just, I think he was more in a state of ignorance of not, you know, not responding correctly in different situations. He wasn't in willful sin, but he did change his mind in some aspects and waiting for God. And once he did, God directed all his attention on uh, going towards the people that were accusing Job. Once Job had that attitude of, you know, submitting to God in the midst of trials and temptations and all that Job went through. Um, that was a place where, you know, he, Job get, rather gave place to the wrath of God. Kind of like the man, the man on the cross. Once the man on the cross next to Jesus said, this man's innocent, we're guilty. Then, then at that point, there is a complete, uh, you know, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. But the wrath of God still on the the you know still coming for the other person that's on the other side of him because he didn't have that attitude. Yeah, I think it's literally as, as subtle as that. I mean, just like you're saying, Wes, God proclaimed him righteous, but then when he tried to say, "Hey, I'm righteous," immediately he was in the wrong when he tried to justify himself. And he should have just kept quiet and let God justify him before his accusation. But that's, I mean, he, what he was saying was true. He was in the right. But what he was saying was also wrong because he was, like, trying to justify himself before God. Say, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't do anything wrong. It, you know, and, and all this happened to me. And, you know, he was right, but he was wrong. And I think that's, that's the point is, like, you, it's so subtle. It's so dangerous. We have to be so careful and so humble and so stupid to God all the time. Well, Jesus and, said, Jesus, exactly. Jesus said, I don't bear witness of myself, but my father bears witness of me. You know, so even Jesus had this concept. He didn't bear witness of himself. He goes, if I bear witness of myself, my witness would not be true. That's what John says. But he goes, even if I were to bear witness of myself, my witness in another aspect, he said, my witness would be true because why he's not speaking anything on his own behalf, but he's perfectly submitted to the father. So Jesus bore this image of submission and out of it, he, he be, it says, therefore, he had, his name has been exalted above every name that is named. So in his heart of submission to the father, perfect submission, it gave him authority above everybody else. So submission equals authority. It doesn't equal weakness. Amen. Yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking about that in terms of, I think a couple of Skype calls back or something, I, I, I said something like, well, I, I think I'm righteous and, you know, the, right, the prayer of a righteous man avails much and all this. And that just talking about this and stuff, and I thought about it before, was I, I think I was in error, and I apologize. I shouldn't declare myself a righteous man. It should be God who declares me that. And if if I claim that, I, that I'm, hey, I'm righteous, guys, then I'm like, I that's exactly what I want to be. But I, sh I think I was convicted of that. I think I should have more the heart of Paul who said, uh, you know, I'm not aware of anything against me but I'm not acquitted by that. You know, it, I think that's the right heart instead of like proclaiming in a way like Job, well, hey, I'm righteous here. I didn't do anything. Well, let God call us righteous. Let well, it depends. It, that depends on the attitude of the heart. We know that David said in Psalms 18, he said, Lord, you have rewarded me according to my righteousness. So it's, it's, it's nothing wrong with that. It's just the attitude of the heart. If you do it in a boastful way, yeah, that's wrong. But we don't have anything in scripture telling us that it's wrong to say that you're that you are righteous. David said that. He said that he was righteous. So that that's not the wrongdoing. It's, it's the attitude of the heart for which you're saying. 
Amen, Don. Yeah, because Paul said, I know nothing against myself. And that's kind of like what Mark is saying. But I'm not justified by this. But he also said, uh, my conscience is clear before God and man. So that's kind of like, what are you talking about, Paul? I thought you were the Romans wretch. I thought, you know, I thought you were stuck in this cycle, which is really, you know, like we say, that was before he became converted in Romans 7. But yeah, it's it's a matter of the heart. You know, if you're if you're just tooting your own horn like the Pharisees to be honored before men, that that then that's one thing. But if you're honestly fighting and contending for the faith so that people don't think that it's some easy believism and that everybody is just going to make it into the kingdom in case rah, rah, whatever will be will be and God's OK with it then, hey, you know what? In your coward of not standing for righteousness, you're going to be rejected when you stand before God. We should be righteous. We should contend for the faith. And we should, the bar should be high. And according to Ephesians 5, it says that he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Are you that bride? Because, uh, and also a lot of people will stand up and say all over the world, they're a bunch of sinners. They're, they're no good. They're worthless. They they and they use use that almost in a boastful way, thinking that that gives honor to God, you know. And, and that doesn't give honor to God. Uh, sin doesn't d- doesn't humble you. It, it hardens the heart. But to say, you know what, I am walking in obedience to the Lord. I am walking in His righteousness. I'm not sinning anymore. To me, that gives glory to God, unless it's being said in a boastful way. But we want to get we want to give glory to God. Just like like I say, what uh, what David said, he says, "Man, I, I I've kept the commandments of God." He said, I, "I'm the Lord's rewarded me according to my righteousness." You know, then you I'm walking clean before the Lord, just like Paul said, just like a lot of disciples said. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the attitude of the heart for which you're saying it. You know, I want to I want to boast in the Lord. I want to I want people to know that hey, you can live this life. I'm living it. You know, so it's like I said, it's just the attitude of the heart. One other thing I want to bring out too, it's it says here uh, in verse thirty-one, for this cause um, that we be one flesh. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. What does that mean in essence? Um, I'm gonna ask you, Daniel. What does it mean uh, where it says here that you leave your mother and father? Does that just mean that you you uh, leave home? Uh, what does it mean? No, I think in a spiritual sense. I, I, I've um, I pondered on this a while. <laughs> you may not agree. But, um, right. <laughs> right, we have to think about Galatians as well in terms of um, chapter 4 uh, and where Paul talks about the two covenants. And uh, from Galatians 4, 21 to 31, he talks about, you know, um, the two, uh, the, the, the son of the bond woman and the son of the free woman. You know, Hagar, Hagar and um, Sarah and you know, Ishmael and um, um, Isaac and, and the fact that one engendereth the bondage. Now, I think in verse, um, I think it's 424, it would talk about um, the Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. Yeah, that's our mother. Um, not like the Catholics believe they think it's Mary. But no, um, the Zion above is the mother of us all. So it emanates from there. We're born from above by receiving the spirit. So when it says that, um, you know, a someone, what does it say? What does it exactly say in Ephesians here? Um, we're just reminded where it is. Verse 24. Yes, a man shall leave his mother and father. I, I, I view that as um, Jesus. A man, Jesus, shall leave his father and his mother. So he comes down from above and comes to dwell in us because we partake. If you go to John 6, we partake of his flesh. The word became flesh. Yeah, he's the mediator of the word of God to us. So therefore we have to, we, it, both the father and the son, as you mentioned already, Don, uh, dwell in us. So it is the, the spirit, the spirit of God gives life and the word of God is now mediated to us through the son. So a man comes down from above and come from his father, gets sent from his father and comes from his mother, the new Zion and comes to dwell amongst us and we become one flesh because we're in the body of christ as christ is in us we are in the body we partake of his body by the spirit okay and and that's the spiritual sense and that, that's really good thank you daniel and and i want to also ask um and, and you can answer it whoever wants to answer it in a practical sense if we go back to genesis chapter two the lord tells um 
speaks there and says, uh, after he created Adam and Eve, he says in verse 24 of chapter 2, he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Um, of course, Adam and Eve didn't even have a mother and father to leave. Is this a futuristic uh, thing that he's talking about here that in the future? And does leaving the father and mother in a practical sense mean just that you leave home? Or does it, uh, or does it go further than that? Uh, well, um, in, in the context of this, just seeing, it, seeing as we've just said the verse before, verse 30, it says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. I think uh, I, I view it as a spiritual sense. I don't view it as a practical. The first Adam, don't forget that Jesus was the last Adam, um, the firstborn of the new creation. So therefore, the, the, the Adam and Eve, in context of what's happening there, the woman came out of Adam. In the in, in from the Genesis account, in the same way, the woman or the bride comes out of Christ. We partake of His flesh by receiving the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So you know, and we're also we're members of His flesh. We're members of His body because we partake of His Spirit. So it's uh, I see this as a spiritual reality, um, rather than just sort of oh well, you know, when a guy grows up, he's going to leave his mother and father. No, I think, I, especially in the context of the verses around it, Don. You know, the no, verse. I, I agree. Yeah, because he, he and, says, and, he says, "I'm speaking of Christ in the church." Yeah. Yeah, and and, and verse yeah. thirty-two. This is a great mystery, but it, right. we can speak concerning Christ and His church. Um, his church being, we just had the verses before. He says, "The church is His body, and the church um, is His wife." This is a sort of parallelism between those verses from verse twenty-three to verse mm -hmm. twenty-four. Where if you just highlight the words, where, you know, it says the husband is head of the wife. So the husband, the husband is Christ, is the savior of of the wife, of the church, of the body. So I sort of put it that way, that way, sort of emphasizes three different ways of saying the same thing. Um, but they link together that that, that relationship between mm -hmm. between the man, the new man, because the, 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 we have to become we're changing to the new man. We have to put off the old man and put on the new man, which, which can be equated to the mind of Christ. We have to sort of be conformed to the mind of Christ and start living as um, as Christ would live by obedience. So um, that's ha that's how we become one flesh by by partaking and walking by the spirit. It's really unique well, Daniel, uh, how he he, um, you know, compares the, the relationship to be uh, between a, a husband and a wife as the relationship between Christ and, and his bride. And in that, he's saying that he's coming back for a bride that is without spot and without blemish. So what about all these people that are thinking that they are the bride of Christ because, you know, they, they, they call in themselves Christians and they thinking even now they thinking that uh, they're going to make it when you got here, you got here that he's not coming back for, for uh, people that are not, that have spots and that have wrinkles and that have blemishes that they still can be blamed because of, without blemish, doesn't it mean that um, you you know uh, you can't be blamed for anything. There's nothing you can blame for. But they themselves are are admittedly saying they can be blamed because they have sin in their lives. So how many people are going to miss this, thinking that they're going to be with the Lord and they're not what Jesus said He's coming back for? What kind of church He's coming back for here? Yeah, they're trying yeah. to they're trying to separate the bride of Christ from the church of Christ. And yeah, exactly, Wes, yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's no separation. If you're not the bride of Christ, you're, you're not his because he's coming back for a church. He's not necessarily just coming back for a bride. There's no, there's no categories of like, well, this one's the bride of Christ and you know, this one's a little further down. You know, they're, they're just gonna inherit this section in heaven, but they're not actually his bride. That's a false teaching, and it really is, you know, first off, it's accusing God of favoritism, um, and secondly, it's it's saying that you can live lukewarm, and he's not going to spew you out of his mouth. And Revelation says, if you're lukewarm, and you're not hot, and you're not obedient, and you're not obeying his commands, and you don't overcome the world, you're not going to be with him. And it says it in multiple different ways and facets, just in case somebody gets the wrong idea. If you just read the Bible as a whole, the bride of Christ is his church, and that's who he's coming back for. And only those are that without blemish, that's why James says, pure and undefiled religion is this, 
to to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And you know, this this is throughout the entire New Testament. May the Lord sanctify you holy, spirit, soul, and body, and preserve you blameless until the coming of the Lord, not at the coming of the Lord. And you know, we see this concept over and over again. And I think, you know, you leaving the the symbolism here. For this reason, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Um, it, even on the the flip side, that we as the body of Christ, when Christ said, "Come, follow me," to his disciples, all of them had to leave everything. Mm. You know, they had, they they had to leave James and John had to leave their fishing business. When you know God called Levi or Matthew, he left his tax booth. Everybody has to forsake all to find the pearl of great price. Mm, that's good. So it, it's kind of like, uh, say, in, in Luke 14, where he said, whoever doesn't hate mother, father, his wife, and his own life cannot be my disciple. In other words, he, he's got to leave all that and, and, um, and cleave uh, to, to, to his wife as Christ with the church. Um, so that's, that's, that's good. So Because I see a lot of people uh, in in Daniel, I, that's why I was getting to it, trying to apply this. A lot of married couples have a lot of problems because they still keep their uh, mom or dad involved in the relationship. Uh, I see a lot of problems there. The, the, the wife calls the mom or the da- husband calls the dad or whatever, and they get all entangled with, the, um, with, the, with their parents in the relationship with them. Uh, is, is that... Is that part of what it's saying here? Or does this not have anything to do with that? Oh, well, <clears throat> um, well, from my point of view, I, I think it's a spiritual uh, bit here in this particular context of the chapter. Um, but, but of course, that all goes without saying that if you that if you're now redeemed by the Lord and uh, you're no longer in charge of your life, essentially from Galatians two twenty, then then of course um, you should be only only trying to um, pray and uh, follow the Spirit and not worry about what worldly people might be saying to you. And that, that can seem quite harsh, you know, in terms of leave your mother and father, leave your leave relatives that you may know. You've got to forsake all in order to uh, follow Christ. And that, that is true because he needs to be able to do with you as he wants. He can't have you clinging on, taking some suitcase of baggage with you um, that requires you not to um, not to obey him fully. It, it, we've got to completely die. We've got to die to that old man. And, and that can be that can be difficult when we've got, relatives and friends that that aren't aren't believers or genuine believers okay you know when i when i look at um cedric i'm gonna bring you in uh when i look at at here in, in ephesians 5 and i look here and i see that it says he's coming out for this glorious church not having spot it makes me think about when a leper who had spots on him um and had leprosy uh that when he was healed or he felt that, uh, you know, leprosy was gone from his body, uh, he had to go and be examined by the high priest uh, to make sure there wasn't a spot left on him. And it, it makes me think about, okay, he's coming back to church without spot. It's kind of like you had leprosy, you had sin. And if you had any little spot of it left on there, you, you could not be released into the public. You was, you were still held as a leper. Uh, so, you know, how much, how much that sin has to completely go away? What do you, what do you think about that that concept? Uh, I think it's uh, good morning. I think it's very uh, realistic for sure. It's uh, definitely to be taken literal. Um, you know, for that particular time. You know that. Um, Can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just making sure. Spirit. Uh, that at that time that it was that literal that it had to be completely clean. Uh, it reminds me of in the book of um, uh, it was talking about uh, Luke's uh, John's dad and uh, John the Baptist's dad. And so at that particular time that um, there was a, a temple that the, the people had to go into, and they had to be completely clean. And if they wasn't completely clean, simply meaning without blemish or without spot, blameless, then at that particular time, they would be killed or be struck dead um, by God. And so they would obviously be dragged out. But it lets me know at that particular time that sin was taken very seriously. 
And uh, if it was to be caught or something like that would happen and the Lord would handle it. But as of today, many people look at sin as it's like very lightly, like they don't just take it as heavy. I know the Bible says that um, uh, a lesser man strive lawfully. And so we're supposed to obey God's commandments. And, and Paul also says that seed, that sin may become exceedingly sinful to make it a big deal. And so I think that today many people are not making sin a big deal. Uh, I know I spoke with several people in the past that they would look at a lie or look at pornography or they would look at uh, possibly stealing as just a sin, just a sin, you know, and by that, by them looking at it like that, they put themselves really in a bad position because they're tearing their conscience and they're not being convicted of what's truly dis disobeying the Lord or displeasing to him. And so uh, that's obviously not what you want to do. And so uh, I just look at that, you know, how in the temple you had to also be completely blameless. You had to be clean in order to, to inherit or to enter that temple. And so the same thing applies today, except the temple and that form and the aspect that we have to come is obviously getting to heaven. Nothing defiled is going to enter Revelation 21. Nothing defiled will enter the temple back in the Old Testament. And so to be clean, to be blameless is nothing that wasn't already spoken of is basically being reiterated. Amen. Thank you. Um, it, it says uh, it seems to really be stressing in verse 27 what kind of church he's coming back for. It's a glorious church, not having spot or, or wrinkle in any such thing and without blemish. So it, it names three things that is it's not it's not to have any spot. Right. It's not to have any wrinkle. So if you got a shirt that you're pressing uh, something, it can't have one little wrinkle in it. What, what that tells me is that it, there's no flaws in it. it can't, there can't be right. any flaw there. Uh, and without blemish, which of course is without blame. So it really defines the church that he's coming back for. And, and uh, it would look like people would fear when they look at this verse thinking, well, am I included in the church? Uh, am, am I um, part of that glorious church? Is there any spot or wrinkle, or anything that, that I could be blamed for, and if we find, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 13, if we examine ourselves, prove our own selves, to see that, then it ought to be an awesome thing to, to come to the revelation and say, you know what, I've got this little flaw here, I've got this little wrinkle, uh, I, I, I need to take care of that right now, and have a true, have full repentance and, and get things right, because I want to be part of that church that he's coming back for that glorious church. It sounds like and then, is, and Don, to me. Yeah. And, and Don, is there, is there like, like in the book of revelation, when it talks about the spirit of the bride saying, come, what is that? Uh, what's the characteristic of the bride? And I think it's revelation chapter 19, right? Um, what is, what are some of the characteristics that the bride has, you know, in parallel to Ephesians chapter five? Um, in, in, uh, and who, who is he coming back for? What does she look like? And is there a first string, second string, and third string? Or, you know, is it just, is it just the bride of Christ, uh, you know, that, that, that he's coming back for? And that's that's what it says, Wes. It, it says that he's coming back for it, that. It talks about the, the bride is adorned. I mean, she dressed perfect for her husband. It, it, it says in Revelation twenty one and two, and it says this, this woman uh, in, in Revelation nineteen. She's got fine linen on. She's clean. She's white, and this fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So that's the description of what. He's coming back for it, just like Ephesians 5 that, that we just pointed out. That's very good, Wes, to think of that, of putting those two together of Revelation 19, verse 8, uh, along with, uh, which is right before the marriage supper of the Lamb, along with the verse in Ephesians chapter 5, of to really make sure that you're part of that bride. You want to make sure that uh, and look at what the bride is supposed to look like. <laughs> what is she supposed to be like? Does my life match up with what she's supposed to be like? Because if not, I don't want to miss this thing. I can't be included as part of the bride of Christ if I'm 
if I don't have these, if I'm not dressed like this, if I have any spot, if I have any wrinkle, if I have anything that anybody can blame, that it can be blamed on me, then I need to get those things right quick. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a there's a wedding banquet, there's a wedding feast, and we know according to what Jesus said, there was somebody that was found in the wedding feast without the right garment. What what happened to them? Did, did they go to a lower place or are they just going to be like, you know, with God on the earth? What does the scripture says happens to that person that doesn't have the right wedding garment on? Are, are they still going to be with God, Don? Matthew chapter, I think you're talking to referring to, uh, what is that? Matthew chapter 20, um, 22, where it talks about that, uh, it says here, the person that doesn't have the wedding of Matthew 22, 12, and he said to him, friend, how came? How did you come in here not having the wedding garment? The Bible says, Wes said he was speechless. He was speechless. He couldn't say anything. Why? Because he could be blamed. And it says, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen. So you want to be part of that chosen part. Now, it's not just about being called. It's about being chosen. And we look in here at what bride, is, what is required for, to be part of the glorious church, how she's to be dressed. This guy did not have wedding garments on. Somehow he got in, but he wasn't, but he wasn't really in. He, he got thrown back out. And, and the, we, the, the hey, outer another darkness. Another thing I wanted to bring out. Go ahead, Wes. It's fine. Well, I was just going to say the outer darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth depicts that it's it, it's not going to be a place of utopia. <laughs> Every person's going. So go ahead, Seth. Oh, that was a good point. Yeah, I was just saying in Revelation chapter 22, verse um, 11, it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Like most people believe that whenever they die and they actually get to that day that they're going to become blameless on that day and that they're going to mm. become holy yeah. on that day but it actually happens now you know like while you're here on earth it says that That's he right. that is unjust let him be unjust still and he that is filthy let him be filthy still but he that is righteous let him be righteous still and he that is holy let him be holy still so it's a good point amen that's good. Well, I, I think this pretty much concludes uh, Ephesians chapter 5. If anybody else has a comment on it, um, go ahead. And, and if not, then we're going to maybe close out here and go into Ephesians 6 next week. Anyone have something to comment uh, on this chapter? Yeah, I, I'm kind of confused about something maybe. Uh, when, uh, when we're talking about um, repentance and having a full repentance, something like that, um, I, from my understanding, that's according to the knowledge that you have. Um, so it would be if, if you, it's, it, so it would basically come down to a right heart. Like anything that I'm aware of, I would turn from immediately. And that goes into the examining of yourself as well. But that also leaves room for not for, for lacking wisdom and knowledge in certain areas of your life that may not be revealed to you yet or things that you don't even consider sin right now, but later in your maturity, you recognize them as being sinful. And I was just curious about how you guys thought about that because I'm kind of struggling with the way you guys are talking about repentance and no spot, no blemish, nothing like this. To me, that would require, if you, to me, the, the right heart covers that not having perfect knowledge of everything that you may or may not have done that was sinful if am i am i being clear on that do you guys understand what i'm questioning yeah about? uh there's yeah. sins that there's sins that are unto death in, in first john and sins that are not unto death the sins that are unto death are, are are sins listed like in galatians 5 ephesians 5 uh romans 1 um uh, you know revelation 21 that lists uh, sins that if you do those things you shall not inherit the kingdom of god also, we have sins like unforgiveness. Um, you can't be forgiven if you don't forgive others. Uh, so we know that no one that's not forgiven can enter the kingdom of God if you don't forgive others. You can't be forgiven. Um, also, you have sins that uh, the Lord convicts you of and that you are to turn from. If you avoid that and your heart becomes callous and uh, 
and you resist, uh, the, you are quenched the Holy Spirit, that is troublesome. But even David said in the book of Psalms, he says, Lord, keep me from presumptuous sin, sins that I'm not aware of. So those things are, are not kind of against you in that way. They will, they, they're not sins unto death. So the things that you are aware of is what you're accountable for to turn from those sins that will keep you from the kingdom of heaven. So that, and that's what it's really talking about, I feel. Somebody else may have comment on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it all has to do with the, a matter of the heart and we grow in knowledge and grace. So we have greater knowledge. It's like what James says to him who knows to do right and does not do it to him it is sin so it all has goes back to the to what you know and if you go against your conscience um then then it becomes sin you know he who he who does not you know do anything in faith is sin so that's why if you know you don't eat in faith then you know it, it just gets back to the conscience and i think if if you just can look at it like that you're not trying to to pull the wool over god's eyes and say, hey, Jesus worked righteousness for me. There's this magic cloak. Even though I'm not working righteousness, he doesn't see me as sinful. Anybody that has that type of heart is has a heart of treachery, guile, and they're trying to be very deceptive. And then they're they're not right in the eyes of God. They're not a Christian. Um, but you know, like you're saying, Mark, is you know, if, if you're doing something in ignorance. Then, then that's different. God's blood, you know, Jesus's blood does cover those issues. It's like what Hebrew said. He, you know, the if if after someone comes to the knowledge of the truth, if they willfully sin, you know, you know, it, at that point, your willful sin, you're trampling the blood of you know God under feet, and it doesn't cover you. You know, there's no sacrifice to atone for willful sin. And and that's where the difference lies. But that's a that's a great question, though, and, and uh, uh, tells me where you're at, you know, and Mark. And so that, that was a, a great question to ask that needs that everybody needs to be clear on.